I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 16 this morning. John chapter 16. I want this morning to deal with the subject, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the scriptural sign. Verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. Now, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, stressing the absolute necessity for him to go away. And he says, it's expedient for us that he go away. Then he tells us why. I tell you a truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Translated here, comforter, but Holy Spirit. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. And all things that the Father has are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and show it unto you. Then over in Acts chapter 1, we have a continuation by Jesus of this same teaching and same promise of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 and verse Four, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. Now, what promise of the Father? Well, we just read it back in John 16, John 14 also. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Then in verse 8, he says, when you're baptized, you'll be empowered because the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So here we see a definite promise. The night of his crucifixion, the last supper of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then after his death and burial and resurrection and just before his ascension into heaven, which takes place also in chapter one of Acts, he promised again the Holy Spirit. There's no subject in Scripture that ought to be approached with more reverence than the study of the Holy Spirit and the question of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so how presumptuous are all of those arguments that you so often hear from people about its validity, whether or not it's for today or for the church or whether or not speaking in tongues is the scriptural evidence. Those arguments are rather presumptuous in view of the passage we've just read, because you see how petty those statements are that question the validity when you realize that Jesus said it's absolutely necessary that I go away. And he said that more than once. And then he said that I'm going back to heaven for the express purpose of sending back the Holy Spirit to baptize you in the Spirit. Now, that's clearly taught in John 14 to 16 and in Acts chapter 1. Now, some people say, well, of course, the promise was only for the 12 or for the early church. But that isn't so, according to Acts 2, 38 and 39. When they asked what we must do, he said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, and then you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yes, he said, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he said, that gift is to you and to your children and to all of them that are afar off even as many as the Lord your God shall call to salvation. In other words, Peter sets the limits himself on the day of Pentecost when they had just received the baptism and said there are no limits as long as God is calling men and women to be saved. All who are saved, he said, the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit is to them. And then we see this all, A-double-L, being fulfilled in Acts 2, 3,000. Believed and received in Acts 8, said every Samaritan, well, at least all of Samaria. Then in Acts 10, Cornelius' house. And then in Acts 19, you see the all, including Asia Minor, getting off there in the area of Europe and so forth. 
And so not only was it for the 120 and the 12, but it's not to be limited to them, you see, because it is very, very clear that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience that we are all to have if we are Christians. Jesus said these signs will follow them that believe they will be speaking in new tongues, and you don't speak in new tongues without the baptism. Now, are you a believer? Then you must receive the Holy Spirit. It isn't an option. It's just one of the things that he says, I don't want you to go out until you wait for the Holy Spirit. Now, the church today has obeyed the commission to go, but they forgot to wait. (laughs) Jesus said to wait and to go, but wait before you go. So no man or woman ought to go out trying to be anything for Jesus until they're empowered. Like he says, if it wasn't necessary, then he wouldn't have said it was. He says, it's necessary that I go away so I can send the Holy Spirit back to you. And so men who ridicule this experience are the speaking in tongues, evidence that they have no fear of God in their hearts because they're actually ridiculing God. Since my Bible says it's the Holy Spirit who comes and baptizes us and it's the Holy Spirit who gives the utterance. A person who ridicules speaking in tongues for whatever reason, even with that unscriptural argument that it's the least gift, is a ridicule of the Holy Spirit giving something that is not to be desired. It's a ridicule of the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit who gives the utterance. There's a lot of difference people discover between the creeds and the Word of God, and they don't know which to believe. It's more convenient to believe the creed, of course. The creed says this is an experience that you receive automatically and inevitably, unconsciously when you're saved. But the Bible says it's an experience you receive subsequent to salvation after you're saved and you have to ask for it, Luke 11, 13. Their doctrine says if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yet their experience denies the fact because they give no evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism makes a real change in a person's testimony and walk and victory and everything else. So there's a lot of confusion between the Word of God and the creeds, doctrine, and what the Bible says. Dr. John G. Lake, in one of his sermons, tells about all the confusion that he went through concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit, a typical denominational experience. He said he went through it too. And he tells in this message how that so many people are confusing the baptism with so many other experiences. And this is precisely what the church of our day does. They confuse it like I did for years. I confuse the baptism with the fullness of the Spirit. I said, well, we already have the baptism, and as we yield more and more to the Spirit, we're to yield to Him, then we'll be more and more filled with the Spirit. Well, now, there is such an experience in the sense that there's a growth in the Spirit, that is, a growth in Christ, and as you yield to the Spirit, then more and more does the Spirit have control of us, but that isn't the baptism. The baptism is a once-for-all initial experience, and then the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 3 and 4, is a growth. But he tells about all the confusion he went through and so many other Christians do. So maybe those who hear this tape are those of you who are here without the baptism. And there are some without the baptism. You can see that you don't have to go through all this confusion. Here's a man that spent 10 years of learning what the baptism isn't. He said when he was saved, then immediately his Christian friends said, you've been baptized in spirit. Well, there was no evidence of it, but they, like the church today, were equating the baptism of the Holy Spirit with salvation. And then he said a little later he heard about the doctrine of sanctification, entire sanctification, and he worked and prayed until he thought he'd become sanctified. And then he said people were telling him, now you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, being sanctified is being baptized in the Spirit. Some good Methodists will recognize the connection, but still no evidence. I mean, evidence, not just the scriptural sign of speaking in tongues, but no evidence in his ministry life. Then he said later on, he, you know, believed James 5 and started praying for the sick and God started honoring his faith. See, God will honor the faith of a non-charismatic as quickly as a charismatic. It's just easier to believe when you have the baptism. And he said God began to heal them. And great healings took place, you know, as much as could take place without the baptism. And he said, people say, you surely must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because anybody that God is honoring their prayer of faith that way, you must have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, he went on and on. And he accepted the fact he must have it because the church and the creeds and all Christians said he did. But he knew that he didn't as far as any experience. Then he said this went on for about ten years. Ten long years. Well, I waited fourteen. 
ten long years. And he said one day he met an old Pentecostal with the baptism and the scriptural sign of speaking in tongues. And he said he told me more about God and the Bible in a few minutes than he'd ever heard from any man in his life. And he said, if this is what happens to a man who's baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, he said, that's what I want. He'd had the baptism three other times, three other ways, you know. But he said, if that's what the Holy Spirit will do for you with the evidence of speaking in tongues, he said, that's what I want. And that's what he got. With the scriptural evidence, he said immediately his entire ministry changed. A great anointing came upon his ministry. Word of knowledge began to function. Now, if you read uh, about the ministry of Dr. Lake, you know he not only had a tremendous faith, but a tremendous anointing. He's a man that no germ could live on his body. He treated people, you know, in Africa with prayer during the bubonic plague. People dying like flies. They took some of the spittum off of a corpse. He said, no germ can live on my body because of Romans 8. The life of the Spirit of Christ is in me. They put it under a microscope after it touched his hand and all the germs were dead. But he had great anointing. He said that now the word of knowledge began to operate and people that had incurable illnesses are things that doctors couldn't diagnose by laying on of hands. He could tell what their disease was. In his church in Spokane, there are at least 100,000 cases of authenticated healings of all kinds of things. Now, he didn't pray for people just because he came for prayer. He taught them first. And if he prayed for 60 people, 60 got healed. But remember, I've told you before, he would not pray for your healing till you sat under his ministry of the word for 30 days. And people wonder why they don't get anything when they hear one message. Say, well, I did what he said. And it didn't work again. But anyway, great healings and such anointing. He said after I received the baptism, the scriptural baptism, he said such anointing when I'd pray for the sick, people couldn't get within 10 feet of me. They'd fall flat on their face by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the power was so strong, he said, even opponents would come in his meeting and all he'd have to do is point to them. He said one man stood up and opposed him. He said, just pointed to him, said, sit down. He said he fell down like he was shot and couldn't move for three hours. <laughs> Another man who had a spirit of hypnosis in him was practicing that on some of his members. And he said one day in the church, he just rebuked that spirit. He was sitting there on the front row and rebuked it. And he said that man lost every bit of his power and came back and insisted that he give him that power back because he could no longer hypnotize people. But I'm just saying, here's a man for 10 years that had everything that Christians today say that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when he got the real thing, it made a difference. Thank God for men like Dr. Lake, who are not going to listen to the dead teachings of dead churches, who tell them they have something they know they don't. Now, in their hearts, some of you that don't have it, you know you don't, even though your creed says you do. Thank God for people that will not listen any longer to the dead teaching of dead churches, dead men in dead churches often, preaching dead doctrine that they're going to press through by faith and get what God's got for them, all their inheritance. So I want to deal this morning with some of the popular objections and questions and debates and arguments and just show you how foolish and futile they are, deal with some of the hindrances to receiving and so on. I've got an article here I cut out of a religious paper. The title of the article is Nazarenes Outlaw Tongues. <laughs> well, I wonder if God's heard about that, that tongues are to be outlawed from the church today. We're going to have to change the word, I suppose, to fit with their doctrine. But it goes on to read, they passed this resolution that any practice of speaking in tongues as evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit shall be interpreted as inveighing against the doctrines of the Church of the Nazarene. You notice carefully they said any practice of speaking in tongues as evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit shall be interpreted as being against the doctrines of the Church of the Nazarene, but they didn't say against the Word of God. Because they don't dare appeal to that because the Word of God says you will speak in tongues, Mark 16, if you're a believer. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 14, 39, forbid not to speak in tongues. So they didn't appeal to the Word of God. At least people with little discernment can see that they were setting their doctrine over against the Word of God. They're standing in opposition to the Word. They didn't say this is contrary to the Word of God to speak in tongues as evidence of baptism, but it's contrary to our doctrine. And you'll have a lot of denominations and church people and churches tell you that we don't care whether or not that it's in the Bible. We don't believe it here in our church. We don't want that in our Baptist church and so on. 
There are a lot of people that have outlawed tongues from their intellect or their mind because of the teaching they've had. Preachers will get in the pulpit and say, or you'll read this in some of the anti-literature, which I don't read but occasionally has come across my desk. You read statements like, well now, Jesus didn't speak in tongues, and you know as a Christian we should only do what he did. I'm not going to speak in tongues because Jesus didn't. Well, I always ask a person, if I can get to them, to ask them, how do you know he didn't? I mean, if we're just going to stay with that thought, how do you know he didn't? He was filled with Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He was baptized in the Spirit in the River Jordan when he was baptized in water. How do you know he didn't speak in tongues? I've got as much right to say he did as you say he didn't. I mean, that's enough to answer such a silly objection. We're only going to do what he did. <laughs> You'll have to go to Palestine to fulfill some of the things he did. <laughs> you eat a lot of things he didn't eat. And it wasn't for religious considerations, but I don't think Big Macs were available in those days. <laughs> I mean, it's really ridiculous to say you're going to do only what he did. That's a, to use popular terminology, cop-out. To keep from facing the issue. How do you know he didn't? Well, of course, that isn't the question. We're not trying to say that he did or didn't. That isn't the point. It's not an Old Testament experience. It is a Pentecost experience. It begins at Pentecost. No one spoke in tongues unless Jesus did, and the Bible just doesn't say. No one spoke in tongues until Pentecost, because that was going to be the sign, the scriptural sign, the evidence of the baptism, that the Holy Spirit had now come. How would they know? They thought they were drunken. You couldn't tell by the anointing. The anointing will get you to stagger around sometimes. I've had to get out of bed with the anointing. It was so strong. Couldn't lie there. It's just like... Lying on 110 volts. You've got to get out of bed and walk and move. I've had people say their legs hurt. They had to run. Maybe that explains why some of the early Pentecostals would run around the tent. And I might even add climb tent poles. There's been a lot of criticism about Pentecostal reaction, but some good old Methodists have ended up in the floor too in the early days, as well as some Baptists. But that isn't the point whether or not he spoke in tongues. They all did in the book of Acts. Are you going to say you're better than them? I'm answering the objection, not looking at anybody here in particular, but are you going to say you're better than them? All the apostles spoke in tongues. Are you better than the twelve? The hundred and twenty spoke in tongues. All in Cornelius' house spoke in tongues. The Corinthians spoke in tongues. The Ephesians, Acts 19, spoke in tongues, and on and on and on. Whether or not Jesus spoke in tongues, everybody in the New Testament church did. But that principle isn't valid anyway to say you're only going to do what Jesus did. Jesus never went to a college or seminary. And preachers who stand in the pulpit and say we should only do what Jesus did should throw their degrees away or not go in the first place. And the churches are doing a lot of things that he didn't do without his permission. Jesus never built a cathedral or established a denomination. But men are. We're going to do only what he did. Jesus never held a fish fry or a cake bake sale or a church raffle to gain money for the church. Jesus never sent the sick to hospitals. Jesus never sent the mentally ill to the institutions to rot. Oh, hallelujah. Well, we can just preach a sermon on the first objection people have to why I don't speak in tongues, they say, is because Jesus didn't. There are a lot of things that Jesus did or didn't do for that matter. Jesus didn't baptize in water. He said, we must. Now, the Word of God says he did not baptize. His disciples did. So if you're only going to do what he did, quit baptizing. Jesus never confessed a sin, but he said, we better. Don't ever confess a sin because he didn't. You see, it's ridiculous to make statements like that, but it's just as ridiculous to say, I don't speak in tongues because he didn't. There are a lot of things he did or didn't do. Jesus didn't speak in tongues. He said, we would. Yes, he did. He said, if you're a believer, you will. 
He said, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name they will speak in new tongues. Mark 16. So it isn't a question of whether or not he spoke in tongues. He said, we would. That's the sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, praise God for people who have an open heart. We're not arguing or debating because for 14 years we thought we had what some people think they've got. And we discovered we didn't have it. And when we got what we thought we had, we saw it wasn't what we thought we had. And it was a whole lot better than what we were saying we had. I hear other people say, or you read these objections sometimes, they say, well, I believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a valid experience for today. I also believe that sometimes some will speak in tongues. Because the Bible says, you know, in 1 Corinthians 12, that there is a gift of tongues. I believe in prophecy, they say. I believe God heals. You know, there's some people not completely shut out to the supernatural. And so they say, I believe it's valid, but I don't believe everyone will speak in tongues. Now, generally, what they mean is, I believe, like men, maybe like R.A. Torrey, the first president of Moody, which, by the way, was baptized in spirit and spoke in tongues. Now, Moody doesn't publish his books anymore on the baptism or speak in tongues. They publish only the ones that do not say that he had the baptism. The first president of Moody Bible Institute has literature out, and it's available if you go to the right bookstores, that he wrote saying that he was baptized in the Spirit as an experience for today, and the scriptural evidence is speaking in new tongues. First president of Moody, and now tongues are taboo at Moody, I guess you know. We could tell you some things about people who've taught there and got the baptism and are now not teaching there and that sort of thing, but... What they mean is that some will speak in tongues. They mean maybe a missionary sometime off in Africa will have a real experience or someone like Finney, Charles Finney, speaks of receiving this great anointing of the Holy Spirit and spoke in ecstasy for quite a while. He was beside himself, just as Paul says. That's what the term ecstasy means. He said, I'm beside myself in the Spirit. Now, he doesn't mean he's lost his mind because then again you're suggesting the Holy Spirit would give or do something that is not just quite right. Well, it's not normal in the average church circle to see a person heavily anointed with the Spirit, as Paul often was. I remember on the day of Pentecost, they were so anointed, they thought they had gotten into the new wine. But generally, that's what they mean. They're talking about, I believe that sometimes someone will speak in tongues, or some do. Generally, they mean somebody like an exceptional person that way. And they will cite 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul asks the question, do all speak with tongues? And they say, see, not all speak with tongues. That is true. That's exactly what he said. But 1 Corinthians 12 is speaking regarding the gifts of the Spirit. He starts out in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1, now concerning the spiritual things, the spiritual gifts. He said it would not have you to be ignorant. Then he begins to deal in that chapter with the gifts. So there's no question about the fact there is a gift of tongues. And verse 10 of chapter 12 calls it diverse tongues, many kinds of tongues. They're kinds of tongues. No, not everyone has the gift. But Jesus said every believer would have the scriptural sign when he's baptized in the Spirit. Mark 16, these signs will follow them that believe they will speak in new tongues. So all who receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit have the initial scriptural evidence of speaking a new language of praise supernaturally, but not all have the gift. I remember when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I, of course, received the scriptural evidence, and I thought that was a gift. I didn't know anything about the gifts. How could you? Coming out of the old dead church life, and so I was listening one time to a tape This was quite early in my charismatic experience, and I heard on there that not everyone has the gift of tongues. I thought I did. I thought every Christian who was baptized in the Spirit had the gift of tongues. But he said on there that 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10 says that the gift is kinds of tongues. That is, divers are many kinds of tongues. I said, well, I thought I had that, but apparently I don't. So I immediately went into the bedroom and said, Lord, I just want it all. So I'm asking for, claiming, ask for the gift of tongues. And I began to praise God in the one language that I had been using, supernaturally speaking that as I'd been praying. And I'd claimed the gift and immediately I went in. I think I counted ten before I quit. Changes. In fact, the change was so great that for an hour I couldn't speak a word of English. And I only got my English back five minutes before I had to preach that night. So that was the gift of tongues. Oh, I know there's a gift. It's the diverse kinds. In fact, last night as I was praying... I began to pray in more than one tongue, more than one language. So I know there's a gift. There's no question, but that's what he said. But that isn't all that's said. 
because it's like faith. You see, every Christian who's saved has faith. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there is spoken of a gift of faith. Now, these people who say, you know, that not all speak in tongues because it's a gift wouldn't say that not all Christians have faith because it's a gift. You wouldn't say some Christians have faith and some don't because it's a gift. Because while it's the same anointing with the Holy Spirit and a differences of operations in the scriptural sign and the gift of tongues, so with faith. It's the same faith, but one is a gift and the other is the faith that every Christian has. Romans twelve three for God has given to every man the measure of faith. Galatians 5, we all have the fruit of faith. Ephesians 2, we are saved by faith. But no one says because that there's a gift of faith mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 that not all Christians have faith. And so any spirit-filled Christian can speak in new tongues anytime he lifts up his voice in faith. But only those who have the gift will be anointed to speak in the assembly to bring forth a revelation from God, of course, with interpretation. It's the same spirit. There's just a difference of anointing, difference of operation. So we can't give any credence to that argument that only some of us are going to speak in tongues who receive the baptism. Everyone that we've prayed for who receives the baptism speaks in new tongues. And then one that some people don't quite know how to deal with, one of the objections that you sometimes hear, people will say, well, now, if this is valid for today, then why don't we have the scriptural signs just like they did on the day of Pentecost? You're talking about scriptural sign as being tongues. They say there are other signs on the day of Pentecost. Why don't we see the wind and the tongues of fire on their head when they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? In other words, why isn't it like the day of Pentecost? If it's the same experience, then why don't we see the same signs, the other two signs, besides speaking in tongues? People are saying, how could it be the same if we don't see those? Well, apparently they've never read the book of Acts to ask such a question. There's no fire and wind in Acts 8 when the Samaritans received, and they said they were baptized in spirit. There was no wind and fire in chapter 10 when they were baptized in spirit. There's no wind and fire in Acts 19 when they were baptized in the spirit. In fact, in Acts 19, it says that when they were baptized in the Spirit, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there's no prophecy in Acts 2. So the disciples at Ephesus could say to the church in Jerusalem, if we follow this argument, you don't have a valid experience because you people didn't prophesy like we did. The church in Jerusalem say, you don't have a valid experience. Where's your wind and fire? And so on and so on. Well, Believe me, friends, a lot of poor, deluded, non-charismatics take these arguments so seriously they think they've answered every objection that you could raise. Well, there's no wind and fire in these other passages. That only happened on the day of Pentecost. Now, if you read down through history, sometimes it occurs again. It does occur. It happened in Indonesia in that great outpouring, both wind and fire. The firemen one day thought the church was on fire. They actually saw the fire. And rushed in with their equipment and they were in there praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You can read all about it in Mel Terry's book, Like a Mighty Wind. The wind, they've heard the wind. Amen. But this is not what Jesus said would be the evidence. There's nowhere he said that wind and fire are prophesying, for that matter, would be the scriptural sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said speaking in tongues would be the sign. Mark 16, this sign will follow a believer. He will speak with new tongues. Well, he has to be baptized to do that, so obviously he's speaking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah says that speaking in tongues is a sign. He calls it a sign. He never speaks of wind and fire being a sign. Then Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 cites Isaiah's prophecy about tongues being a sign and cites that as the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So if it's valid today, we'll have all the signs. If it's valid today, we'll have the sign that Jesus gave. And that's speaking supernaturally in a new tongue. You see, the reason we don't have all these other evidences as the sign, though sometimes they are there, sometimes this has happened down through church history, early Pentecostals, sometimes the whole service would be tongues of fire on all the people. I've read of accounts like this. But the reason that you don't have all of these things as the sign is because they're not uniform. Speaking in tongues is the one thing that is universally recognized. It's uniform. It's consistent. It's the one thing you look for after a person receives. That is initially. As we said last week, there will be a change in their life too if they yield to the Spirit after the baptized in the Spirit. But we're talking about the evidence of baptism, not the results of it. 
Well, another objection along this line that people raise is that if it's the same experience, then why doesn't it happen just like at Pentecost? Now, here they're not talking about the signs, but they're talking about that great outpouring that happened on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out in such mighty power there that those Jews who had just murdered Jesus Christ were so impressed by it, half of them said, you know, they're drunk, and the other half wanted to know, what meaneth this? What meaneth this? Oh, it would pay the church today to ask, what meaneth this? They'd get the same answer from God if they asked sincerely. This meaneth that the Holy Spirit has come when you hear the glory barn speaking in tongues. That's what it meaneth. And so they say, well, why isn't it just like that? Why do you have to ask? They weren't asking. Why do you have to ask? They say, if it's the same as the Pentecostal experience in Acts 2, why doesn't God just baptize his church like he baptized 120? You know, just en masse, all 120. And you don't see them coming one at a time to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why do we ask? Because Jesus said you had to ask. That's what he said in Luke 11, 13. My Bible says you have to ask to receive the Holy Spirit. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that are Christian? To them that get saved. No, he said to them that ask. Hallelujah. Them that ask. What in the world? Do you think those 120 were doing there on the day of Pentecost? In fact, for those 10 days between Ascension and Pentecost. Chapter 1 says he promised the Holy Spirit says, Now wait, don't you leave until I send the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we read they were praying those 10 days and nights for Jesus to fulfill the promise of the Holy Spirit. Certainly they were asking. Not repetitious asking, but asking in faith. Holding on to God in faith, waiting for this great anointing to come that he promised. What do you think they were doing? Go back and read Acts 1 and 2. You'll find out they were there praying. And if that isn't asking, I don't know what it is. Sometimes you don't have to ask, but those are the exceptions. The Indonesians, by the way, didn't ask. God poured his spirit out upon that Presbyterian church because, well, in his sovereignty, that's the way he wanted to do it. But he said, we've got to ask. That's right. And so we're not talking about exceptions and you can't prove anything but them. Because anyway, that disqualifies the argument. Why doesn't God do it that way? Well, he did in Indonesia. So either way you look at it, there's no basis for the argument. Why didn't he do it like on the day of Pentecost? But I have some first-hand information. The Word of God shows us how they received on the day of Pentecost. But God in a vision, one of the clearest visions he ever gave me, Now, I mean, some of them are in the realm of the Spirit. Some of them, you know, you actually see. This was early in my charismatic experience, and God gave me a vision telling why He does not do it generally like over in Indonesia, or generally like on the day of Pentecost. And I didn't know it. In my educated ignorance and your educated ignorance, you would never know in a thousand years why God doesn't do things a certain way. We've got all these ideas if all oh, the signs and miracles we just start having them, the word would get out all over town and all that. Yes, it would. And then you'd get a write-up in the media. They've lost their minds over there. They're laying dead babies on the altar and praying for them. And, which, by the way, has already been said. It'd be worse than that, wouldn't it? The signs, dear friends, the signs of miracles are not what God is doing in this hour or ever did. He's sending men to preach his word and he confirms the word with a miracle. He's not doing miracles. We've already touched on that in some of the evening messages, how that most charismatics have such a superficial approach to the charismatic or the supernatural. All they do is look for God to demonstrate his power and then forget why he's doing it or they don't know why he's doing it. And if you've got 50 people on a healing line, their eyes will switch. As soon as one gets healed, they'll go to the next one, see what God's going to do, what God's going to do, what's God going to do. And forget what they're up there and God is telling them that the word you heard before he prayed for these people is what I want you to believe out there because I'm not going to give all of you a miracle. I'm going to let you have it by faith. And so on. Well, God showed me in a vision... Why that he does not generally do what he did at Pentecost, repeat that tremendous outpouring in churches, dead churches today. I was invited to speak in an Episcopal church. Now I'll get the picture. Formal, high church. On the subject of the present day charismatic experience and outpouring. That's a miracle, you know, to get to do that in the first place. Now, I haven't had the baptism, oh, I don't think a year, maybe a year and not over a year. So I don't know at all by any means. And so I, oh, I'm really praying about this meeting. 
This is one of the biggies, you know, that you really want to do everything right. So I'm in my study praying and praying and praying. And so I hear myself, you know, really getting scriptural. Lord, let's have another Pentecost in our Episcopal Church. Lord, I'm just going to believe for a great outpouring of the Spirit there. Lord, you know how dead these people are and how dry. Of course, I know Baptists are that way and Methodists, but just the big cathedral type atmosphere and all. I said, God, let it be another Pentecost. I said, that'll turn that church upside down. In fact, it'll turn Fort Wayne upside down. That's where it was. And he said, yes, it would. And gave me a vision. Oh, I said, Lord, another Pentecost. Let it be just like the day of Pentecost. Then they'll believe when these dry, starchy Episcopalians speak in tongues and reel around under the ecstasy or whatever, just like Pentecost. And he showed me a vision. I've never related this before as far as I know. This is the first time. I was in a family room, you know, that is below the rest of the house in the modern homes. And I could see through a great bay window the yard out there. I was looking through a window and had a big window seat and all in it. And I was asking God to pour out his spirit on this Episcopal church like he did at Pentecost. Same identical experience. That would really change them and upset them, turn them upside down. The whole world would hear about it. And so as I looked out, I saw the grass and the grass was dead. Just little tufts here and there. Not real green there, but half dead there. Just a little bit of life here and there on this lawn. And as I was watching this, I noticed in my line of vision, there was a big vessel of water in the window. That is, setting on the window seat. It wasn't just water. It was steaming water, hot. Now, in Scripture, water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, for example, in John 7, when you receive the Holy Spirit out of your innermost parts will flow rivers of living water. This spake you of the Holy Spirit. So, water is a type of the Spirit. And, of course, when you're in the Spirit, seeing a vision, you know the meanings. I knew that this had a spiritual significance. There was this big vessel of water, dead grass. And so I heard myself saying, you know, praying, Oh, why doesn't somebody go out and pour that water on the grass before it dies? It's almost dead. There's just a little life left. And God said, Now this is an answer to your request for a great outpouring like on the day of Pentecost among dead denominational people. He said, You see that grass? He says, That represents the churches, the denominations. He said, Most of them are dead. Now, you wonder why I have this burden to preach like I do. Some people hate for you to mention the word denomination. Dear friends, I've got a burden. This is a prophetic message in this church. You're going to have to get with it or you'll never hear what God's saying in the rest of the message. He showed me early in my charismatic experience that the denominational church is dead. D-E-A-D. Dead. He said there's just a little life, you notice, here and there. And it's almost dead. Now, he said, in all of your zeal, you want somebody to go out or you want to go out and pour that hot water, you know, that speaks of the power and the anointing and the intensity of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit isn't something weak or anemic. The Holy Spirit is power. He doesn't have power. He is power. You will be empowered when the Holy Spirit comes. He said, now, if I do what you say... It'll kill what little life's left. You can't pour hot water, boiling water on grass, especially dead grass or grass that is almost dead. He said, you'll kill what little life's left. He said, what you'll have to do is let the water cool. Now he's back to the symbol again. Let the water cool, then take it out there and pour it on those green spots, half dead spots, and gradually they will come back to life. Then I saw a man walk across the view of vision out of this Episcopal church. Of course, I'd never seen him, didn't recognize him when I got there. But it was just a type. Saw a man from this church where I wanted this great outpouring to happen. Walk across my line of view. And as he went by me, he said, Brother Freeman prayed for me to receive the Holy Spirit. And I did, but there was no great annoying or anything. And I only got two or three words in new tongues. But he said to take it by faith, and I'm going to do that. He said to take it by faith. You have the baptism. That is the evidence, whether it's one word or three or three thousand. That, those two or three words, is the evidence. And as you exercise your faith, more will come. And he went on out, and as he shut the door, he said, I believe that, I receive it. Now, God was saying, dear friends, in the vision, and I know this is the first time we related it, that if he does pour out his spirit on dead denominational people like 
Acts 2, the book of Acts, and like he did in Indonesia, and sometimes, you know, in his sovereignty he does that, it would kill what little life's left because, you see, it would frighten them to death. They wouldn't know what to do with it. If even one or two of those Episcopalians would have got an Acts 2 experience, I mean, in that mighty outpouring, it would have scared the rest of them out of the building. And as it was, about 50, 40 to 50 received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If even one or two of those Episcopalians would have got an Acts 2 experience, I mean, in that mighty outpouring, it would have scared the rest of them out of the building. And as it was, about 50, 40 to 50 received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And every one of them got that little timid, quiet experience that you would expect of an Episcopalian. But they got it. And God said, now you go teach my word on the baptism and you promise everyone that will receive it in faith, they will receive it. He said, I'm going to meet them at the point of their faith. If they could stand a great anointing, that's what they'll get. But of course, nobody could because nobody got that. But he said, I will meet them at the point of their faith and understanding and level. And you wonder sometimes, Pentecostals will wonder why some of us who come out of denominations receive such a quiet experience. I've heard them say that. It's because that denominational people couldn't stand anymore. They wouldn't know what to do with it. It would frighten most of them to death. Oh, people pray in their dead churches, Lord, baptize the speaker in the Holy Spirit. Let it be another Pentecost when he preaches this week. If God ever answered that prayer, why they all over one another making for the exits. God in his wisdom, in his infinite wisdom, he said, now, no, it's not time for Pentecost like that. You just go be faithful and I will honor their faith if they believe. And he did. He honored their faith night after night. Praise God. So why don't we see another Pentecost? That's why. That's why. It's because in all of your zeal and in your intellectual wisdom, you may think it would be otherwise, but God knows best. If God didn't deal with us on the level of where we're at in spiritual matters, none of us would even get saved. Amen. Amen. So these objections just don't hold any water, and God many times shows by the Spirit just why that we can't receive these things the same way. It's the same Spirit, but not the same operation. It's the same Spirit, but not the same anointing. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 speaks of ignorance and says he doesn't want us to be ignorant. And so people who say that we don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit today or the supernatural signs are not for today have never read the New Testament that we're told these gifts, including tongues, are set in the church. I mean, if only a few did speak in tongues are for today because they've been set in the church. I mean, if it was only the gift operating, as we know it isn't, it would still be for today because they're set in the church, like healing set in the church and teaching set in the church and prophecy and the apostle and everything else. Acts 2.39, he says that this experience is for all God calls. Then there's an interesting passage in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 7 and 8, to answer those people who say, well, the supernatural, including tongues, is not really for today. My Bible says that these things, the spiritual gifts and the supernatural, will be in the church until Jesus comes. We all know about 1 Corinthians 12. It would pay some of us to read chapter 1 first. He said, verse 4, I thank my God always in your behalf. Verse 5, that in everything you be enriched by him in all utterance. Now, that's all kinds of utterance. English, there it would have been Greek or tongues or prophecy. In all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's prayer is that they'll become behind in no gift. That is, they'll be lacking in no spiritual gift until Jesus comes. He says, the gifts, I pray, will be manifested in you in their fullness until Jesus comes, as you wait for the coming of the Lord. You know, there are a lot of statements like that in Scripture for people who will just take the time to look at the Word of God. The power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit were needed by the early church. And if they were needed then, they're needed today. They were needed then to arrest the attention of people, to confirm the Word, to destroy the works of the devil, to meet the needs of the church, to minister to the church. And it reveals a lack of New Testament understanding for people to say, we don't need the supernatural and the baptism, the anointing, the tongues and the gifts today. It reveals a lack of understanding of the New Testament because these two things are never set over against each other in the Word of God. That is, preaching the gospel or miracles. But you see the two together all the time. Like in Mark 16, they preach the Word accompanied by signs following to confirm the Word. This is the way God appointed it. 
in Mark 16, that we preach the word, preach the gospel with signs following. That was Jesus' method. It says that he worked many signs and wonders in Acts 2. In Acts 10, it says that he was anointed of the Holy Ghost in power and he went about doing good, healing all who were sick and destroying the works of the devil. And so to say that we can preach the gospel today or we have the full revelation and all we need is the word and we don't need the signs is to reveal a lack of what the New Testament says because the apostles in the early church saw the absolute need of confirming the word. Right after Pentecost, it went right back in Acts 4 and began to pray again for a great anointing, a great outpouring, and for God to work signs and miracles that people might believe. And Paul confirms his own ministry by signs and miracles. He said, I didn't just preach the gospel to you. I didn't just preach the word. I preached the word in power and in the Holy Spirit. Which obviously means with the power of the signs to follow. And so many, many passages in the New Testament will show you that New Testament evangelism is preaching the word accompanied with signs following. And for a person to say that we don't need the supernatural, the baptism, and the evidence of the baptism is to say that we don't need what God says we do need. As I've said so often, missionaries and evangelists labor for years trying to make a few converts. And they don't bear much fruit is because they don't have the anointing, the apostolic anointing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. William Carey, it's tragic, and we don't say this to criticize the man, but we certainly criticize the methods of men without the baptism who won't believe the word. But he labored for six years to make one convert. Now, where do you ever read in the Bible that's the way to go present the gospel? One verse, give me one. You'll never find that. We're talking about preaching the gospel. We're not talking about the fact that most of the world rejects it. But preaching the gospel is accompanied by signs following and people do believe it. There will be cases where they don't believe. But you don't labor for six years to make a convert. Or like the missionary in the seminary when I was teaching there gave his lecture one day and said, We've been in India ten years. We think we have two converts. Two dubious converts. Millions going into missions. And then I read in a charismatic book that someone was quoting this missionary who in tears said, we've been in India 30 years. Hear it. I didn't say it. He did. He's a missionary. Said, we've been here 30 years. We don't know of one Hindu converted to Christ through our ministry. 30 years. And they just go right on and pour the money in and ask people to come to the altar and dedicate their lives to that. That's dead denominationalism, friends. That is not the word of God. One man labored five years and no converts. And he said, well, that's missions. Yeah, that's missions, but that's not Bible. That's unbelief. That's a lack of an empowering. You can't argue with the facts. Well, one man like Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, William Branham, Jack Coe, many of these evangelists down in our time, friends. We don't have to appeal to the 18th century somebody in Africa. With one message, see thousands saved because they confirmed the word with signs following. Labor for six years, five years, ten years, thirty years for one or two dubious converts and many times none and say that's missions. You can't justify that in the Bible. I don't see how missionaries can come back and ask people to give to that sort of ministry. That's what they do. They beg and plead on their itineraries for money. Praise God, after I got the Holy Spirit, went up to Canada and heard the 80-year-old missionary from China, a woman, say that as an 18-year-old girl, God said, go to China. Well, who am I going to get to support me? What denomination? So forth and so on. He said, I didn't tell you to go with the denominational support. I said, I'm sending you some missionary. Go. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. God never sent a missionary through a board. Now, I don't care. The hour is too late to care what people think. They better wake up to what we're saying. As one man said in his book, he said, a man disqualifies himself at the beginning if he cannot go out without support. If he can't go out just trusting God. Now, that's true about any ministry. Of course, we teach that here. That's nothing new here. But she went out with nothing. I mean, that was many, many years she stayed there knowing no one. Where do you go? How do you get there? God said, I'll send you. He supported her the whole time by faith. Hallelujah. 
We're talking about the need of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those who say they don't need the baptism saying we don't need victory. We don't need fruitfulness. We don't need success. All we need is the paycheck every month or whatever. All we need to do is go through the movements of saying this is church or this is missions or this is evangelism. As another brother said that God showed him directly, told him directly. There's no evangelist without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's no evangelist who does not have at least two gifts operating in his ministry. He'll have word of knowledge and healing, or word of knowledge and discerning of spirits, and so on. He will have to have those. God said to confirm the word. It's one thing to ask for a sign. It's another thing for God to say, I'm going to give signs when my word is faithfully preached. If you ask for a sign, Jesus said in Luke 16, you wouldn't believe it anyway. But it's another thing for God to say, if you're faithful, I'll confirm the word. Mark 16, 20, I'll work with you, confirming the word with signs following. Well, those of us who have received the Holy Spirit know that he does just that. I don't care where you are in your level of charismatic experience. God will confirm his word when you're faithful to it. One former Baptist friend that I had when I was non-charismatic and lost his friendship when I received the baptism... He said, Mark 16 doesn't say that these signs will follow them that have the baptism. Well, of course, it does say that because they'll speak in tongues. But I knew what he was getting at. It just says these signs will follow them that believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. I said, are any recovering that you lay hands on? I said, you know they're not. And he just kind of got sickly gray and grinned and had no answer to that. I said, are the signs following your ministry, brother? I said, you know they're not. I said, they're following mine. And I said, they didn't until I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's the test. And he knew they weren't following his ministry. He couldn't answer. So, yes, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, there's some hindrances we'll cover briefly to receiving because it is a fact that sometimes people... Hear your message like I just preached about the validity of the baptism. I answered all the major objections. It just did. Anybody with with half a heart open could say, well, I better re-examine my denominational or mental position on this. But even though they hear what you say, they don't hear what you say sometimes. One brother said, how do you get to people that just can't seem to receive the baptism? They listen to you teach on it, and yet there's some block. I said, brother, you'd be surprised how many times people think they've heard you, but they haven't. Oh, their mind is saturated with unbelief. And that's no criticism because that's where we all were. And they don't realize how difficult it is to hear what you're saying. You'll tell people, don't come unless you're going to act your faith and believe you have received and so on. And yet people will come... And tell you, well, I'm not sure I've received. And heck, my faith, well, if it's the baptism, it'll just happen. And it's as if they haven't heard a word you've said. So here's some major hindrances. Hindrances to receiving or maturing in the experience after you receive the Holy Spirit. One, and this will hinder you, dear friends, an attitude, negative attitude, or a negative confession. Proverbs 6, 2, you can be snared by the words of your mouth. And then... He also tells us that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So what you're thinking and what you're saying can prevent you from receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but people time and again will come and say, but I've tried and tried and tried and tried and I just cannot receive the Holy Spirit. I've been prayed for and I can't. And they do not realize that their very confession prevents them from receiving. A woman up in Chicago. Pray for her to receive the Holy Spirit. I said, you will receive. Do you believe you have received? Yes. Then I said, give the sound of your voice to the Holy Spirit. This stops a lot of people. We'll get to that in a moment. But you've got to act your faith. You know, all these, what do I say? I don't know what to say. Well, of course not. I just said, begin to speak. Not English and it'll come out in new time. Oh, I said, I can, I can, I can. I said, don't say, I can, I can, I can. Say, I can, I can, I can. <laughs> she said, I can. And she did. It's the attitude. People say, I've tried and tried. Others say, well, I've received, but for five years, I've only had two or three words. Why don't I go on? I don't enter into the joy of the experience because, you know, two or three words over and over in five years or two years or ten years. And why can't I? And then you will repeat back to them what they said and say, did you hear why you can't? 
have but two or three words. You just keep saying, I can't. So when you get on your knees or in the car, wherever you pray in the Spirit, you know you expect two or three words. And that's all you get. Now, time and again, I, as well as my wife, have dealt with people like that in a little bit of patience and said, now you are going to speak more. Believe you will. Lay hands on them and you start and then they take off 90 miles an hour. It's because you build a little confidence into them and show them they're defeating themselves by their negative attitude and confession. Well, I think we know something about the negative around here because we know that will defeat you quicker than anything else. Another hindrance to receiving is reliance on feelings. Now, we said last week, Galatians 3 teaches that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is received by faith. Paul said you received the promise that Jesus made, the promise of the Holy Spirit, by faith. <coughs> Not feeling. And so people will say, well, I prayed for this experience. Or I've been to a dozen different meetings where they prayed for people to receive the baptism and I've never felt a thing. People receive the Holy Spirit Speaking in new tongues, but I can't receive. I never feel a thing. Why don't I feel something? I don't know where they got the idea. It didn't come from the New Testament. Acts 2 doesn't tell us how they felt on the day of Pentecost. Have you ever read in there how they felt anywhere in the Bible? When they prophesied or spoke in new tongues? It just said they spoke in new tongues. I've spoken in new tongues when I never felt anything. As far as feeling you need to read our book, Why Speak in Tongues. You'll find there's a difference between praying with feeling and not praying with feeling. You don't wait till you feel something to pray in English. That's right. That's right. Oh, I just don't feel anything, so I'm not going to pray today. I guess I'll have to skip it. <laughs> That's when you need to pray. <laughs> Praying in the Spirit has nothing to do with what you feel. He says you edify your spirit. Yeah. And that isn't feeling. You don't feel with the Spirit. You feel with the flesh. What they mean is, I didn't experience a tingling, an anointing. Have a vision. Fall out in a dead faint or whatever it is. <laughs> I'm talking about hindrances to receiving as well as maturing in the experience. See, some never get beyond the baptism. They've stopped at Pentecost. They've stopped with praying once. When they receive the baptism, they've never spoken in tongues since then. We deal with that in our book, Why Speak With Tongues. But some people say, well, I don't get any anointing to speak. We're still dealing with feelings. Right after I received this experience, pastor and his wife, charismatic pastor and his wife, invited us into his home. And after dinner, I was new, didn't know anything, and so I wanted to learn all I could. I just picked everybody's brain that was charismatic. I learned probably twice as fast as most people because I worked at it 24 hours a day getting all the information I could. I just sopped it up like a sponge. I still am that way. But that makes the difference between people who go ahead in a hurry and people who... Wait for feeling or something to happen. So I just wanted to know everything right away. And I said, how often do you pray in the Spirit? Two or three times a day. You know, like he's going to say, two or three times a day. Man, I spend half my time praying in the Spirit. Two or three times a day. He says, two or three times a year, maybe. <laughs> Pentecostal pastor. I said, two or three times a year. And here I am praying in the Spirit every day. And he said, well, I don't pray till I'm anointed. He said, I'm anointed once or twice a year and I bring a message in the church. Isn't that pathetic? Waiting on feeling. Well, bless their hearts, Pentecostals have taught us to rely on feelings. And the Word teaches us to rely on faith. Feeling has nothing to do with it. I recommend you feel anointed. That's nice. Praise God. Tell us how you were anointed and how you felt. But that isn't going to help us or help you in the future. You're just going to relate your blessed experience. Want me to tell you about anointing I had once? One time I was anointed. No, you don't want to hear it because it's going to minister to you. I'm just going to tell you how I felt. I felt this tingling all over. Now, does that make you feel good? <laughs> One time I was sitting in a rocking chair, praying in the Spirit, and great anointing. God spoke to me. Well, praise God. <laughs> but what's that got to do with praying in the Spirit, or faith, or healing, or whatever? And it's a blessed experience to be anointed of the Holy Spirit. And we enjoy hearing you tell about it. That isn't what we're saying, but... How you feel has nothing to do with it. So don't rely on feelings. If you will accept the baptism of the Holy Spirit by faith, the assurance will follow. If you want to call it feeling or whatever, the assurance will follow. I had to learn that. I've already said it. When I received the baptism, spoke just as dry as toast and crackers for two minutes. Felt like an eternity. Didn't feel a thing. How can this be the baptism? 
But I'm going to believe I've got it. I've tried everything else. But act my faith. So I was acting my faith, my two or three little old syllables. Dry, no feeling. But I was acting my faith, and for two hours, the feeling, the anointing, the tremendous power was there. Hallelujah. But you have to put the faith first. Then there's a confusion, thirdly, that hinders people. The confusion of the sign with the gift. We've already covered it, but it is a hindrance, so we need to mention it again. Some people say, not all speak in tongues. Of course not. If you're talking about the gift. 1 Corinthians 12, 10. Divers kinds of tongues. I spoke a tongue last night. You generally have a usual tongue you pray in, a language. And immediately, as I was caught up in praying and worshiping the Lord, there came this completely different language. Nearly all vowels, like in Chinese, but it wasn't Chinese. I've spoken Oriental languages many times when I've been anointed. You know when they're Oriental. They're kind of sing-song many times. And I've heard enough Chinese, I've been in the restaurants to recognize it. (laughs) That I know that it's an Eastern language, but last night it wasn't. I was just kneeling there amazed at what the Holy Spirit was bringing forth. Because in 10,000 years, you couldn't make your vocal apparatus do the gymnastics that was happening. (laughs) Complex sounds, very difficult language to speak. Had to keep my mind completely out of it, but I enjoyed listening to myself. (laughs) But I couldn't get my mind in, oh, that sounds like a vowel or a T or whatever. You just had to let it happen, and it was beautiful. Well, there's a gift. Don't confuse that with the sign. Mark 16, Jesus said the sign is all believers will speak in tongues. So there's confusion of the sign and gift. Another hindrance to people receiving or going deeper with their experience is occult bondage. Occult bondage. Anyone who's ever been involved in the occult, innocently or otherwise, Ouija board, fortune telling, hypnosis, reading the doctrines of the cults that is following after them or belonging to, say, Christian science. Many, many forms of occult, magic, charming, whatever, open a door to oppression. And one of the familiar forms of this oppression is, in our travels, we've noticed people, a lot of times, till they're taken through occult deliverance, can't receive the baptism. So if they say, I've been seeking and can't receive, generally I say, have you been involved in the occult in any way? Well, nine times out of ten they say no until you tell them what occult is. Oh, yes, I had this wart removed or whatever by magic charming. And that may seem innocent enough, but take our word for it, it's calling on the dark powers. You're not getting warts removed in the name of Jesus, are you? Or calling on the name of Jesus with your Ouija board or whatever. What we do, we take them through the confession of the occult contacts they remember. They confess that as sin in Jesus' name. That's covered with the blood of Jesus. We recognize you're already covered with the blood of Jesus, but now you're recognizing why you're not receiving the baptism or why you're being oppressed physically or your marriage is divided or whatever as occult involvement in the past. So that is confessed in Jesus' name. Then we have the person repudiate the devil's work in their life. Command the devil to depart in Jesus' name as a result of occult involvement. Now, it has to be done that way. Some people say, oh, I've done it. And then you ask them, did you do it just that way? You find out sometimes it didn't. You have to renounce the sins of occult involvements. You can remember in Jesus' name, you have to command the devil to release you from occult oppression as a result of occult involvement. If you don't mention those things, you just might as well pray to a wall or speak to a wall. You don't pray to the devil, but you speak to him, command him. Now, I don't know how many times I've seen people immediately release from the bondage and receive the baptism with the evidence. That's the only way I know they get it, by the way. Amen. Some people get up, you know, I've been on platforms with people. Well, I wouldn't always say the tongues, the evidence, the baptism. And I get up right behind them and say, I would. <laughs> so that's the only way I know they receive. Yep. That's right. Hallelujah. Well, somebody has to say it. Somebody has to say it. I was on a platform where a Pentecostal pastor said he didn't know. He wouldn't say that you had to speak in tongues to have the baptism. That would be the initial evidence. I got it behind him and said, I would. And another Pentecostal there said, praise God for Hobart Freeman. Now, he wasn't praising Hobart Freeman, but praise God, he was saying for a man that will get in public on a platform where he's one of the speakers and say just the opposite to what somebody else said. In fact, a Roman Catholic priest. We had everybody there. Baptist to Catholics. And he said, no, he had the baptism without the evidence. And I got up behind him and I said, well, when he gets the baptism the New Testament way, he'll have the evidence and he'll be the first to tell us about it. 
Well, he took it in good humor. I don't know about the Pentecostal pastor who offended him or not, but he took it in good humor. He said, all right, you may be right. Praise the Lord. I've seen people receive the baptism after going through occult deliverance. Those two simple steps. Sometimes they have the baptism, but they're not maturing. They're still bound. And they only have, as I say, three or four words. They want to go on. You're not going anywhere with three or four words because this is a prayer language to edify you, to go against the devil, to intercede and so forth, as the scriptures say. You can't do that with two or three words. About all you're saying in two or three words is praise God or Jesus is Lord, and that's good, but you're supposed to pray in the Spirit. You don't pray in English and just say over and over, Jesus is Lord or praise God. You can say it all you want, but that isn't prayer. I prayed for a Baptist woman. Two or three words. I said, you're going to speak more, but it's this bondage. And so we took her through that and immediately, without any encouragement, began to flow in this new language. So I call depression as a hindrance. The fifth area of hindrance is a lack of understanding of the purpose and value of speaking in tongues. And that's why people don't receive the baptism. They say, what do I need with tongues? I just want the baptism without it. And so they want it on their terms and not God's and they're not going to get it. So that's why they've written the book. Because so many people say... Well, why speak in tongues? The title is, Why Speak in Tongues? A Christian's Threefold Ministry Through Prayer and the Spirit. You have a ministry to yourself. It edifies you. You have a minister to others. The Bible says you're interceding for them. You have a minister to God. We're told we speak mysteries to God in the Spirit. We're worshiping Him. And so, when people say, What do I need with the baptism? Or... If it's for me, I would have it because I've asked God to give me all that he has. You're never going to receive the baptism until they understand the purpose of it and why they need to speak in tongues after they get it. Then another hindrance is a lack of the exercise of faith. They will come for you to pray for them, not with any expectation of releasing any faith, but hoping something's going to happen. It didn't happen before. It hasn't happened in the other 12 times. That people have prayed for them, but they're hoping that it might happen this time. And so they don't release any faith. Now, dear friend, you're not going to receive anything from God, what he's promised, until you exercise some faith. People who want prayer on their terms are not going to receive from God. If you want to accept the fact that you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in faith, then God is going to bless you by honoring your faith. But it's going to have to be faith. Galatians chapter 3, we receive the Holy Spirit by faith. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I've discovered I've prayed for countless hundreds of people to receive, and you could count on your right and left hand the ones who didn't, and those are the ones who wouldn't act their faith. And I'm going to tell you something. I've never seen, and I don't believe they can receive. I've never seen anyone receive it. I don't believe they can receive the Holy Ghost with their eyes open. <laughs> I'll tell you, there's nothing that dampens my faith quicker than when they go through all of the ritual of getting up here and saying they want to receive or anywhere we're ministering. Do you believe you're receiving all that? You lay your hand on their head and you close your eyes and say, receive the Holy Spirit. And you open your eyes and they're staring you eyeball to eyeball. <laughs> or they're looking around. <laughs> it is not the attitude of the Spirit. <laughs> All of those who have received have really been with it. They've been intense. They're believing it. Now they're expecting something to happen. But a person is standing there, well, I've been prayed for 12 times. It isn't going to happen. I've never seen it happen. It's not an attitude of faith and expectations, all I'm saying, for you to be staring around. I invariably... Now, a lot of them have received because I've said, close your eyes, get your attention on Jesus, tell him how much you love him, begin to worship him, but don't do it in English. And it'll come out in new tongues. Now, you can have your own opinions about that, but I'll tell you, I really have to <laughs> pray for a little overcoming grace. When I'm in the spirit, praying for them to receive and open my eyes and there they're looking around. One woman said, well, I don't want tongues. I just came for the baptism. <laughs> and went and sat down. Oh, praise God. Well, so say we're not criticizing people, but if we can help you in any way we can, we will. Amen. 
A hindrance, we're saying, is not exercising faith, not acting faith, wanting the baptism on your terms. That's a great hindrance to receiving. Amen. You know, you've got to act your faith. Acts 2, 4 says they spake as the Spirit gave them words to utter. The Spirit doesn't utter them. You speak. Now that sounds elementary to us, and yet we'll have people come who won't speak. Yeah. Even though they've heard you say that over and over and over. They'll say, but if it's the baptism, the Holy Spirit will do it. Where'd they ever read that in the Word? Amen. It says they spake, the disciples as the Spirit gave utterance. Sometimes they'll say it, but I don't want to say what you say. You know, I'm there praying in the Spirit, waiting on them to start. Oh, I don't want to say what you say. I challenge them to say what I say. Go ahead and try. That's just an excuse for not exercising faith. Go ahead and say it. That's just an excuse. Isn't that getting a little strong or hard on these poor people to keep trying? No, I went through the same unbelief for three whole weeks. I'm trying to save you the same problem. Did everything you don't do to get the baptism. And I said, just like they said, I'm not going to utter a peep. If it's Pentecost, if it's Acts 2, it'll be just like there. The Holy Spirit will do it all. I didn't have any teacher. So I sat for three weeks like a little bird on a limb with mouth open waiting for something to happen. <laughs> Nothing happened because no one had said, look, you speak in tongues. You speak what the Spirit gives you, but you speak. And I said, there's one thing I won't do. What I read in somebody's book on how to receive, it said, if you lift up the sound of your voice, the Holy Spirit will anoint that and it'll be the new tongues. I said, that's priming the pump. I'll never do it. <laughs> Don't you ever say that you won't jump over the fence if that's what's required. Because that's what you'll have to do to get the Holy Ghost. And I've seen it happen since. A person says, you know, one fellow, oh, I don't want to receive the Holy Ghost in the car. I want to pray for him in the car. Oh, this is spiritual experience. It ought to happen in church at the altar. Well, you know where he'll get it. In the car. But... I never utter a syllable. That isn't the way it is in the book of Acts. They're lifting up the sound of their voice. It just says they were filled with the Spirit and began speaking new tongues. The Spirit gave them utterance. That's what it says. But I wasn't reading what it said. They spake as the Spirit gave utterance. So I tried everything. Brother said, who in the seminary where I taught, he had received it. He said, come up Chicago. There's a full gospel businessmen's meeting up here. And said, they often pray for people to receive the Holy Spirit. I tried everything else. I thought, I had everything else. I started out, it has to be someone from my denomination with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it has to be a man. <laughs> it wasn't but a few days later, nothing happening, pounding the floor, beating the chair, crying out, pleading for the Holy Ghost. You see, once I get to the place I believe something is valid, I'm not going to wait another week to experience it. It wasn't but a few days until I'd reduce it. could be any Christian. wouldn't have to be my denomination. <laughs> as long as he was a true Christian. Then I got down to the place, Lord, it can be man or woman. Because I couldn't see the validity, you know, of a woman praying for somebody to receive the Holy Ghost because I'd read about some that was happening. And I was still pretty bound as a Baptist. Believe it. I said, anybody, Lord, anywhere, anytime. <laughs> I went through the stage, let it happen in the bedroom, you know, because I didn't know what was going to happen. And then I will experience this and I can tell my family and the church and all a little at a time. And I said, anywhere. Well, after three weeks of fasting and praying and making restitution and confessing and repenting and pleading and begging and all of those things you don't do to receive it. A lot of those are good exercises, spiritual exercises. You receive the baptism by faith, not by works. said, come up here. And then he told me it was McCormick Seminary. And I said, well, how could you get the Holy Ghost in a liberal seminary? So I almost didn't go. But I was so hungry, I went on anyway. Pentecostal pastor there, I'll tell you. The most Pentecostal you'd probably ever hear. And a lot of Pentecostal folk around there, a lot of them had their shoes off and patting their feet, clapping their hands. and Nothing was offending me. I'd never seen that in church. Shoes off and patting their feet. <laughs> Well, it's all right now, but as a Baptist, you have to overcome a lot to get in a Pentecostal context first time. But I was so hungry, nothing. 
So when he gave the invitation, about 50 people rushed for the lounge. My wife and I were first. <laughs> Nothing happened. Pray for us first. Nothing happened. Everybody received everything they wanted. Including many received the baptism. We got nothing. So as I knelt there, I said, Lord, for three weeks, I've done everything I know to do. I've come all the way to Chicago. And I believe it. I said, there's one thing I said I wouldn't do. And I will do. I've done everything else. I said I wouldn't prime the pump. And the Lord dropped three syllables into my spirit. Something like, Laba, Dama, Die. Laba, Dama, Die. That's all. That is meaningless. Except the devil said, that's Hebrew. Then later he said, it's Greek. (laughs) You're just recalling some words you don't remember. If you speak those, you'll be a hypocrite. That's false. That's from me. (laughs) I was so hungry. I said uh, three weeks. Now, three weeks for me to wait for something I believe in is three weeks longer than I should wait. Longer than I will wait. I had no teacher. To this point, no one told me what to do. So I did it on my own. I just began in all of my dry Baptist speaking those three syllables for two minutes. My head in my arms, down in the corner of the couch, afraid someone might hear. Because I didn't know what would happen and how foolish would it sound. La ba da ma da, la ba da ma da, la ba da ma da. For two minutes, that's all happened. And then just like that. It doesn't have to happen this way for you, but the Holy Spirit literally took my tongue. He took it. And for the next two hours. Now, I still had to initiate by faith. Let Him use my vocal apparatus. But for two hours, I'll tell you, I preached to those people. I preached. And they would bring people around and say, look at this man. I'd ask for a double portion. I'd been so dry. I said, Lord, give me a double portion. Fourteen years to dry baptism, I said, Lord, a double portion I got. They'd bring people around and said, look at this man. Look what's happened to him. And I was a cardiac patient. I wasn't supposed to get excited. <laughs> hadn't been long ago, I'd been in the hospital with a heart attack. They don't even let you brush your teeth, and you're supposed to be quiet. And there I was, my arms there, two hours standing up, praising the Lord in new tongues. Hallelujah. The only reason I stopped, they said, well, we have to close sometime tonight and go home. <laughs> So I stopped long enough to get to the car. Hallelujah. And the brother told me about it. He said, if it wasn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'd be jealous. Because he said, I only had one word for two or three months. And such an anointing I got. He said, if it hadn't been the Holy Spirit you got, I'd be jealous of what happened to you. But he's the one who told me about it, so he'd have to blame himself. <laughs> Amen. Faith. Faith. I didn't feel anything. I felt foolish. <laughs> For two minutes, I was afraid someone would hear me, and then for two hours, I was afraid they wouldn't. (laughs) Hallelujah. Amen. Well, stand with us. Now, dear friend, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everyone who believes it. He said, these signs will follow them that believe. Do you believe? All right, then all you have to do is lift up your faith and the sound of your voice. To the Father, in Jesus' name, because Luke eleven thirteen says, If you ask for the Holy Spirit, He will give you the Holy Spirit. And when you ask, expect to receive the scriptural sign of speaking in tongues. Amen. Ask for it the way God gives it, the way He promises it. Why have it in some way different than in the New Testament? Why don't you want it the way they got it so you can be what they were and do what they did? Amen. Say, Lord, I want it just like it is in the book of Acts. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, we just commit this message and exhortation out of your word to the hearts of the people here and wherever it may go. We exhort them to ask you the question, what meaneth this? Knowing that you will tell them that this is that which Jesus promised, the sending of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, thank God for the Holy Ghost. You never be the same once you receive it.